Thank you. Sorry about the long title. I, I figured maybe I should have made it a little smaller, like uh, just just chaos and high dimensional stochastic differential equations. Um, okay, so you know I'm the last talk of the day, so I'll really try hard not to go over because um, I'm sure you guys want to get out of here, and I know there's a dinner coming up. Okay, so one over twenty minutes. <laughs> all right. <laughs> So just to start off, um, as, as many of you probably feel the same way, I'm ultimately motivated by, by turbulence. Okay, so some of this, you know, at some point may get a little far removed directly from turbulence, but, you know, ultimately, you know, I want to understand turbulence. And of course, turbulence is something that is uh, not really well agreed upon by many different people. There are many, perhaps, conflicting definitions. I'll give you a few hallmarks, um, and then I'll tell you what I'm interested in. So, you know, not, you know, turbulence is typically considered to be something that's ergodic, something that, you know, time averages are sort of converged to some sort of ensemble averages. This just kind of allows you to um, take sort of experiments and not have to run them for extremely long periods of time because you can kind of take snapshots instead of having to average over time. It's incredibly chaotic, especially in turbulent regimes. Um, where basically, you know, the, the behavior almost seems random with extreme sensitivity, depending on how you start it. Um, and it's extremely multi-scale. Okay? It, it has sort of a cascade of scales over, over a whole inertial range. So I'm mainly, mainly gonna focus on this. Okay, so, so how do we sort of understand chaos as it shows up in fluid mechanics? Um, now that's an extremely broad question and I'll try to narrow it down a little bit. So let's just consider a simple setting. Um, that is just the case of, a, of an ordinary differential equation on some n-dimensional manifold, let's just say compact, you can just think, or, or Rn if you'd like, whatever. Um, and I have some smooth vector field, so I just consider an OD like this. Um, X there is a smooth vector field, and I have a flow of diffeomorphism that this defines. This is just the map that takes the initial data to where it is at time t. Um, and, and, and often, um, it's not the only way, but often chaos is characterized by what's known as having a, a positive top Lyapunov of exponent. Okay, and this is sort of a way of characterizing um, how sensitive uh, the flow is or how sensitive the dynamics of this ordinary differential equation are to uh, small perturbations in the initial data. So here, this dx is I take the derivative of the flow with respect to initial data at point x, and I look at its asymptotic exponential growth rate. And if this number, lambda 1, is positive, then we say it has a positive Lyapunov exponent. Particularly, I mean, we, we want to consider the case where it has a positive Lyapunov exponent on, let's say, a positive volume set. Okay, so in most places I'm looking at, it ends up exponentially separating. And this is typically considered a hallmark of chaos. Okay, it's, it means it's incredibly unstable. Um, and, and, you know, there's, there's sort of a universal character. In fact, Lyapunov exponents pop up in many systems as universal numbers. They're independent of the initial data if there's some ergodicity, and they're often independent of the metric that's even on the uh, manifold you're considering. So proving positively up of exponents is, is very hard, uh, typically, especially for, for deterministic systems. Um, I'll, you know, even for very low dimensional things. Now, in, in dynamics, people typically in discrete time study uh, flows, things like XMA systems, Anisov flows, or you can even do geodesic flows on, on um, hyperbolic manifolds. These things are, are sort of known to be chaotic, but they have a very sort of uniform hyperbolicity property. And I'll kind of mention a little bit about what I mean by this in a second. This is cases where it's well known, but the, the systems aren't inherently very physical. Um, a very famous example, Lorentz 63, which is the famous butterfly um, picture that you know, I'm sure many of you have seen before, was actually rigorously proved to be chaotic, although it's not very easy to do. Um, it's a computer-assisted proof, and it takes, uh, I mean, it was only relatively recently done. Um, and you know, I won't go into the methods for it, but uh, it is a three-dimensional system, and it takes a lot of work to show. Um, and there's many, many, many simple systems that are left open. So uh, Cherkov standard map, as a, as what's known as the kicked rotor, it's a Poincaré section for the kicked rotor. The ABC flow is just a three-dimensional uh, trigonometric polynomial, essentially, or or what's known as the Lorentz ninety-six system. These are all relatively simple systems. Who you know, you have no clue how to prove that they have positively up of exponents. It's a very hard problem. Um, here's just the picture to see sort of what it looks like. This I think is a, is a picture of the Cherkov standard map. 
the colors associated to particular orbits. So you see, you get these elliptic islands uh, or areas where you get lots of uh, you know nice clean rotation. So this is not going to be chaotic. This fuzz outside here is the chaotic region, uh, and it's just the mix of of colors. So you know, if I could look at this and I could prove that this region out here was had a positive volume, then then you could prove it's chaotic. But that's still open for the standard map. But in between the islands, you do have like homoclinic tangles. Right? There's homoclinic tangles all over the place. Right. Yeah, but there, so that's that's there. If you talk to dynamicists, you know, there's uh, the even the presence of a homoclinic tangle indicates chaos, but not not that there's a positive metric uh, or there's not a positively open exponent on a positive volume set. So the, yeah, I want to be clear that like different different people may have different definitions of what they mean by chaos, and here I mean positively open exponent on a positive volume set. So let me just give you an idea of what can go wrong in that case, though. So if I linearize the equation. Um, so this is just for my ODE, you know, I get a linear ODE, um, but with sort of a moving frame. Think of this as a matrix is changing in time. And this matrix could be very structured. I mean, okay, sure. It could just be a bunch of shears or, or center, even just like in two dimension, as I can with no positive real part. That's pretty obvious. That's not going to give you a positive the of exponent. But more generally, if the eigenspaces twist around, and this is what's happening in time, one that's growing exponentially fast can turn you and flip you over onto one that's decaying exponentially fast, and this game can go on forever, uh, and it, it can be really hard to say that you actually end up inevitably getting exponential growth. Okay, but I want to emphasize that this kind of situation, this is what you know, we're really going to be fighting a lot. It's not really very generic. It has to be very structured for that to happen. Okay, now I'll sort of say what I mean by generic. Now, specifically, I'm interested in the case when you put noise on the system to help you out. Okay, it makes things a little bit easier. For instance, it makes the ergodic theory easier. It makes the uh, uh, Lyapunov of exponents just a theory they always exist by the multiplicative ergodic theorem. Orbits can typically escape the elliptic islands that, that they would get stuck in uh, otherwise. Um, you can estimate probabilities of various degeneracies happening. And you can use, and this is mainly what I'm going to focus on as well, what's known as a rigidity approach or an invariance principle due to Furstenberg to try to rule out these, these, what I was calling cone twisting, which is where the eigenspaces twist on one another. OK, and, and in fact, techniques, and these techniques before, um, I used with, uh, with collaborators uh, Jacob Bedrosian and Alex Blumenthal. You know, we, we use this to prove uh, chaos for Lagrangian flow, uh, which we call quench mixing and batch. There's a lot for passive scalars being invected by, uh, by models in stochastic fluid mechanics. I won't talk about that either because I, I want to talk about some more recent work, but they do fall in the same sort of thing. The, stoch the stochastic uh, deal with the noise. So the noise is like a bombing motion noise. Yeah. I mean, it can be more general. So here's an example. Um, There's a really simple example, but consider uh, a bunch of um, IID matrix. So take, take a, some um, law on SL2 and then randomly sample a bunch of matrices from it and then take an arbitrarily long product of that. Um, so this, this is work due to Furstenberg. Um, this thing forms a Markov process actually on SL2R. Um, these, are, these are determinant one matrices. Uh, and, and the theorem of Furstenberg, more or less, it's not stated exactly like this, but it says, okay, suppose I look at the support of that measure, what matrices this typically giving mass to. Um, if, if I look at the smallest closed subgroup that contains that support, okay, so the support could just be two matrices, but I want they could generate something much bigger. Uh, if that's actually equal to SL2, then, then it has a positively open of exponent. Okay, um, and, and basically like, the thing that's kind of ruling out, for instance, I mean, if, if eta, if the, if the law is supported on just rotations or just shears, then you have lambda equals zero, and you can show that pretty easily. But suppose it's just supported on two matrices. One is hyperbolic, and one is a rotation. This also gives you lambda equals zero. That's kind of the cone twisting example. Um, and these two things you can see, well, it's not too hard to see, but they don't generate SL2. And, and one simple example, just to mention that you can also apply this to is the barycentric subdivision problem. So basically, if I take an equilateral triangle and I, and I find its barycenter uh, by subdividing the midpoint here to the vertex, it splits into, into six different triangles. If I repeat this process in all the triangles, you know, uh, over and over and over again, you get a bunch of very small triangles, but they all start to have different shapes. So some have very long skinny shapes and some of them are a bit more fat. Um, and there was a conjecture by Satovsky that basically said, all right, well, if I randomly pick a triangle at every single stage, uh, this is the Markov chain that I get from that by, ran you know, by randomly selecting one of them, um, 
almost surely does it become long and skinny. Okay, and, and, you, and that, that was actually proved rigorously using this theorem by Furstenberg. Okay, uh, the, the, the sort of non-degeneracy thing is a little bit harder showing that you actually generate SL2, but it's, it's, it's okay. All right, so that's one application of it. Um, the application I'm gonna talk about Thing that I'm mostly interested in is, is the stochastic navier Stokes equations, but specifically, you know, not stochastic navier Stokes is very hard. Infinite dimensional chaos is extremely hard. So let's truncate it. Uh, so we'll take the, the 2D stochastic navier Stokes equations just on a torus. It can actually be of any aspect ratio though, um, which is typically in vorticity form given like this. So it has vorticity being infected by, by the velocity field, which, you know, is related to the vorticity through the Biot-Savart law. Um, it has uh, epsilon as sort of the, the viscosity, and there's some noise that I'm going to assume is supported on a very low number of 40 modes. Um, and, we, and then we truncate it. So what I mean by that is, is okay, I just, I, I force everything to be within a lattice Z2 less than N where the modes have to be um, in some box of size N. And then I truncate all the interactions to be within that. So in this form, actually, the, the nonlinearity, if we look in Fourier, takes the following form. It's a bilinear form like this. The kth mode, it sort of spits out is, is the sum over all modes that sum up to k. And then you take this product here where this coefficient has some, some degeneracies built in. Is that the Laplacian of U or Laplacian of W? Uh, oh, sorry, it's a W. It's Laplacian of W. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So w is the vertice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's the word. Yeah, sorry about that. Oh, it's just called true. So that'd be a strange okay. equation. Um, and this thing has degeneracy, and these actually play an important role. You see that if two modes are, are lying in the same line, this thing's zero, and if they have the same length or magnitude, it's zero. Um, and th these are actually invariants for the dynamics. Okay, but in fact, we proved that, that uh, if you look at the top of the of exponent for this um, SD, then it's, if you take epsilon small enough, uh, lambda over epsilon goes to infinity. How is actually then depending on big N? On big N? It's fixed for any fixed N. Uh, but it has some dependence, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, I don't know how, you know how lambda depends on it. Right. That's no I idea. don't have an idea. No, that would be nice. I mean, then there's some hope you could do infinite yeah, dimensions. Yeah, that's why I asked. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to quantify that. Uh, there's enough, I can mention maybe a few places where, where it's hard, but. Uh, and so, okay, I don't have too much time, uh, of course, but. So what I, what I will do is just give you an idea of sort of how, how we prove this. And, and I'm gonna just go back to a more general setting of stochastic differential equations. Um, but basically, that you know, that the, the Navier-Stokes equations I gave you here are just an example, more general example of, uh, of a stochastic differential equation on some smooth Riemannian manifold. And what you think of here is I have a collection of vector fields, a drift, and then a bunch of noise. Here, this is the Stratonovich product. If you don't know what that is, don't worry too much about it. It just sort of says that this thing has a nice product rule that you don't have to get extra eta terms if you don't want to. Okay, so I have a collection of vector fields. I have a stochastic flow of diffeomorphisms with it. And, and what we want to do is we uh, naturally, and this is sort of how Furstenberg did it as well, and, and there's a number of other works to do this, uh, is you lift the whole process up to the sphere bundle or the unit tangent bundle. Okay, and you do this for just a really standard lifting. You look at the linearization of the vector field as well, and then it has sort of a, a matrix action on the unit sphere. Okay, and so now we have these lifted vector fields. Um, and, and basically, there's a really nice relationship between the top Lyapunov exponent and um, either entropy or, or, in fact, the more important one for us is the Fisher information. And so the idea is basically that uh, if I lift the, the flow up to the, up to the sphere bundle, if there is a, a, a stationary measure that has a density F on the, on the sphere bundle, then, then I can write the Fisher information, which here I'm, I'm these are, think of these as vector differential operators, or, and this is the adjoint with respect to the, the metric. Um, is equal to lambda one minus two lambda sigma, where lambda sigma is what's known as the sum Lyapunov exponent. So it's just the asymptotic sort of volume compression. Um, so it, it's, or expansion in this case. Okay, so you're, you're always subtracting. This is another thing that fails in infinite dimensions. If you, uh, lambda sigma is always infinite in infinite dimensions, and it's not easy to, to get rid of it. Okay, but if, if lambda sigma and lambda one are equal to zero, directly from this, because of positivity, this tells you that, that x star f has to be equal to zero. So there's a very strong rigidity that you get from this saying that, ah, oh, well, if I don't have a positively up and up exponent, then f has to have a lot of structure in it. And it actually solves a simple PD. And then what was n? Where? n. n. Oh, n is the dimension of the uh, manifold. Yeah. 
Okay, and so one of, you know, maybe I'll give you just a, uh, an important theorem that we use here is this is in fact, the, the analog of the non-degeneracy for the, the group theoretic setting for Furstenberg here is that is basically Ormonder's condition. So if I lift all these vector fields up to the um, sphere bundle, if the Lie algebra generated by these guys under the Lie bracket uh, spans the, the tangent space at every single point, um, then using an analog of Ormonder's theorem, you can prove a, a quantitative lower bound on the Fisher information, which gives a quantitative lower bound on the, um, on the Lie algebra exponent. Okay, and so it's in, a, it's in all directions. Okay, so you propagate regularity everywhere. And this allows you to, to sort of show that, well, F, there's no, it doesn't have that rigid structure. Um, and, you know, more or less, you can send epsilon to zero and pass to zero noise limit. Um, and I don't think I have, I'll, I'll give you one last little bit. Uh, basically, so if you want, can you quantify S? You can quantify S. It's basically one over the depth of the number of brackets you need to take to finally span. Um, it's, it's, you can make it precise, yeah. Uh, and, and basically, if I want to apply this to Navier-Stokes, if I want to show projective spanning, I want to mention that's an extremely hard thing to prove. Uh, even, if, even if you know the vector fields so satisfy Ormonder's condition for the SD itself, when you lift it up to sphere bundle, it gets a lot of degeneracy going on. And it more or less, uh, you have to prove that, that if I take derivatives of the nonlinearity, that this set of matrices here, um, so call them HK, and then these are the indices, they're indexed over the, the sort of complex numbers uh, or by the lattice, um, that these things, uh, when you look at the Lie algebra as a set of matrices, that these actually turn into SLM. Okay, and, and this, is, this is an arbitrary dimensional Lie algebra too. And, and so the, the idea being that if you want to show that this property holds, um, it's it's a very very messy sort of set of uh, Fantine equations, um, but you can you can prove it using computational algebra. Um, so that's we, we have a proof of that's very recent actually, but it, um, I can't I won't really go into any details about that. But it is doable. Point being, okay, and I'll I'll skip that and uh, and I'll just leave you guys with um, essentially what what I want to be able to do. I want to be able to prove things in infinite dimensions. There's some perhaps simpler models. There's a lot of things that do get in the way. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of room for improvement as well at the PDE level. There's some hope that you can get sort of better, um, sort of better lower bounds uh, using hypolipticity. And I'd like to be able to use information about the non-epsilon equals zero dynamics to actually get uh, sort of quantitative growth bounds as epsilon goes to zero. Um, be able to actually sort of say things about methods for finding not just exponential growth, but sort of what's not slow chaos or parabolic growth. Um, and in fact, there's a lot of very interesting structure that comes out when you apply these things that are not at your stokes. So if you look at sort of nonlinear Schrodinger or, um, or stochastically forced versions of that, of course, Blair and truncations again, the, um, the, the Lie algebra structure is quite different actually. And there's a lot of invariant sort of sub bundles that pop up because um, it's not as chaotic as that your stokes. And 3D is still open. Okay, and, and that's it. Questions? So what's the biggest obstacle in 3D? Um, uh, just the, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's doable. It's just a big mess, but the, the algebra gets really unwieldy. Um, I think of maybe a good dedicated grad student could probably do it if you had enough time. Um, but I, I don't think it, there's any real obstacle in 3D. Yeah. So isn't the fact that you miss the uh, vorticity formulations going to mess it up? Or are you thinking of formulating with the vectorial vorticity? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't do it. That. Well, yeah, I could do it in vorticity, actually. I, I think it's, it's yeah, the nonlinearity doesn't come out as cleanly, and, and they're sort of... Um, There, there's not as there's I mean basically the biggest obstruction is is this this set of matrices doesn't come out as simply um, it's probably possible to to do it but somehow when you're working in four a uh, in three dimensions you have you don't have as, as nice a four a or sort of a basis either you have sort of you have to consider two different um, arbitrary directions on, on which you're you're considering a four a basis for and that just seems to make it uh, tricky I guess. But again, I, I don't think there's anything, any real obstacle there other than just um, it's kind of messy. Just because it's funky. 
the, so the truncation, actually, that's a, that's a really uh, good point to, to bring up, actually. So this whole proof for, for proving this thing generates, it actually is easier if you send n to infinity. So it's an almost inherently infinite dimensional. Um, and that's kind of why it works for any n. Um, however, when you introduce the, the truncation, it makes a big bunch. It actually, you have to fight it quite a lot um, to show that it, that it still allows the infinite dimensional version of the proof to work. Um, and so in a 3D, it also it just gets even worse. Because more or less, you have to look at all these um, all the artifacts that the, um, that the Galerkin truncation introduce. And in 2D, it's kind of a nice picture. In 3D, it's like a it's a little bit harder to visualize. So you get you get positive exponents with, with, when you add some noise to the system. Uh, yeah. Now, as you let the noise go to zero, can you try to understand how the exponent exponent is kind of stable, right? Yeah. Uh, it can't get too small, probably out beyond your control, but it can probably get quite small, so you still have control over it. You know. As you send, I mean, as you send epsilon to zero, the, the or you mean, you're, you're mean noise, noise. different, oh, only the noise. noise. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, that's that's a good question, actually. I don't really know that, because at, at the moment- um, Because that would mean, if you said it make it very small, you would say the dynamics are really governing the chaos, not not the noise. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Well, because, it, but if you leave, if you leave the Laplacian on here, um, it'll kind of, when you send epsilon to zero, just by Virginia, oh, yeah, you're going to end yeah, up with dynamics high. Right? They just have one point yeah. tractor on it. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much.